All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna get going because I've got I've got enough material for the full hour for your enjoyment. Um, learning make. So uh, has anyone ever watched an episode of Batman? Um, you know where he uses his grappling hook and like he shoots it up over a lamp post and it does this perfect like triple loop thing. You know, and, like. Um, it work, but it works every time, right? It, like he never misses. And it's amazing. So make is a little bit like that. Um, but sometimes you see him use, the, use his grappling hook for something well outside of what I think the grappling hook engineers imagined that grappling hook was for. And this is, this is kind of the problem with make, is it's, um, it's been around a long time. And people like to use it for things that is clearly outside of its, its domain of, of uh, what it's good at. So we'll talk a little bit about what make is good for and some of those borders that you probably won't want to cross, um, or at least how to cross them elegantly. I'm sure everyone's looked at a make file before. This is the basic structure of a very simple make file. You've got some variable declarations and uh, zero or more of those, and then some rules. These here, target A and target B, along with their recipes, are called rules. So this make file has two rules. The purpose of a rule is to tell make when a target is out of date and what to do about it. And we'll discuss this a little bit more in detail in a moment. Rules can have one or more targets. And a target may have zero or more dependencies. Um, rules also have zero or more commands. That's these down here. That's uh, that little group, that little box there is called the recipe. Or sometimes in, if in the GNU make source code, it's called the command set. Um, a target, there are two kinds of targets. There are real targets and there are phony targets. A real target is like a file or a directory in the file system, something you could find using ls. And a phony target um, is, is a not. So a phony target is declared like this. You say dot phony, and any target that's after that becomes a phony target. And make treats that specially. What a phony target tells make is that don't bother checking the file system to see if it's up to date. Just run the target, or run the rule that, that's associated with this target. So phony targets will always run. Um, dependencies, so there's dependency A and dependency B here. Uh, sometimes they're called prerequisites. Um, they will still only run, even for phony or not phony targets, for real targets or phony targets, the, the, the prerequisites will only run if they are out of date. Um, if your dependency is a phony target as well, then it will always run. It will never be checked for being out of date. Um, dependencies like targets uh, may be files or directories. They can have real dependencies or phony dependencies. Um, you can think of, in fact, of a dependency as a target that another target depends on. You can have multiple targets on the left side. Um, when you see this, um, it behaves as if it were two separate rules. It's a way to consolidate multiple rules down into one rule. It makes it very convenient so that if you have similar targets, they can, they, you can de not declare them all over the place and worry about updating them everywhere. You can, you can compact them into one, uh, as we see on the left here. Um, the inverse is also true. You can have multiple rules for one target. Um, if you have, uh, on the top one, we have dependency A and dependency B and C and D down below. When make sees these, it compacts these into one rule that has four dependencies. However, you may only have one recipe per target. Uh, if you try to do more than one recipe per target, make will probably execute the last one and then warn you that, <coughs> hey, you've got multiple recipes for this target. Um, you better fix that. Um, I mentioned that the purpose of a rule is to tell make when a target is out of date and what to do about it, how to fix it. So a target is out of date if any of these conditions are true. The target uh, file or directory does not exist yet. Uh, the file or directory is older than its dependencies. 
or if the target is marked as phony. If any of those three conditions are true, the, the rule will execute. The, the recipes will execute for that rule. Otherwise, you will see this friendly message here. Um, the target is up to date. So let's talk about recipes for a minute. These are the commands that run when a target is considered out of date. Commands must start with a tab character. If your um, editor uh, indiscriminately changes tabs to spaces, you'll want to fix that when you work in a make file. Otherwise, things will not work, and you will have no indication why. Make gives you almost no uh, helpful uh, information about that. So make sure that you've got tabs when you indent your. So there's no way around that. Okay, there is a variable uh, that you can change. Like in Perl, there's a variable to change everything. Um, but it's kind of like dollar square brace in Perl, right? The 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 index offset oper uh, variable. You know, instead of zero based arrays, we're going to be one based arrays. And what does it say in the in the manual? Uh, its use is highly discouraged, right? Uh, similar for this. Um, Anyone else operating in your make file will go, what, what, what happened here? So yeah, just get used to tabs. Um, most editors have some way to indicate visually that there's a tab there. Uh, you know, set your mode. I'm sure Vim has some very fancy ways to do that. Um, so make executes a recipe, the, the commands inside of a recipe, very simply. Um, it removes any, at the beginning of a make, uh, command, there are some optional characters that you may see. There's an at symbol and a minus sign. Um, a, a rare one is a plus sign. Um, make or just removes those and it marks the command in a special way, like the at sign we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and, then, and then it interpolates any variables, make variables that are in there, and then it simply hands that string off to the shell. To, for execution. Make doesn't know anything about the shell. It doesn't know how to parse anything that's in the command area other than the first character. And, and then it scans it for variables. Um, make is largely, uh, uh, does that very minimal pre-processing and then just hands it off to the shell. Now, which shell? Well, the born shell, of course. Um, and, and again, you can change that using the shell variable. Uh, but this doesn't happen often for good reason. Um, if any of the commands in the recipe fail, processing stops there. An error will be shown. And um, subsequent dependent rules will also stop processing. So sometimes you can be far down into a long make build. Something fails down here, and it has to cascade all the way back out again. Uh, you have to scroll up to find where it actually failed. But that's what's going on, is that one command failed. How does it tell a command failed? Non-zero exit code. Very simple. Um, and finally, this is a thing that seems to trip a lot of people up. Every command in the recipe runs in its own shell independently. So you have a different shell for each command. So we have talked about um, the make file format specifically, um, rules, targets, dependencies, and recipes now. Uh, we'll talk just briefly about variables and macros, or, or macros. They're the same thing to make. Um, there are two flavors of variables in make. There are deferred or lazy variables and immediate and simple variables. So the top two are lazy and the bottom two are immediate. What that means is uh, an immediate variable, as you can see, is pre uh, is, uh, uses the colon equal. That tells make, when you see this declaration, look at the value as it exists right now, and that is what will be inside of the variable. That's what that's, the association is made at the time the variable is declared. In a lazy variable, um, the variable value is not evaluated until it's used. And there's two, uh, the, both of these have um, good uses, and we'll, we'll, as we go through some of the examples later, we'll, we'll see some of those uses here. Um, Here's some inter interesting things about variables. Um, all your environment variables, home, path, editor, pager, whatever other environment variables you have in your shell. If you type env right now in your shell, you'll get all the environment variables. All those variables are um, present inside of make. And make sees those, reads those environment variables, and converts them into make variables with the same name. So there's a make variable called home. There's a make variable called path. 
And um, those are useful because those are all then later uh, created in the environment for recipes as they execute. So any of those shell commands will see that inherited environment, which you can then alter inside of make. Um, you can set make variables in the environment. This is the third bullet here. So before I run make, I'm setting a shell environment variable path. Make will then see that, and its path inside of make will have a different uh, path than, you know, than the outside. Uh, another way to do that is to send it in as a make variable on the command line. These two look very similar. The syntax is very similar, but this, is, this references a make variable, and this references an environment variable outside of make. And this is, this is another thing that trips people up, is that the syntax is so close to shell, um, but it's not. It's not shell. It's make. So we'll, we'll look at that right now. Um, there are things called target-specific variables. And those do not pass into the commands environment. And I've got a little asterisk there. Remind me about that. You can set variables globally, which is typically how things are done in make. It's just a big pile of global variables. Uh, but you can also set them on a per target or per rule basis. Uh, and these are extremely useful for creating modular make files. Uh, you can think of them almost as lexically scoped variables for the rules or targets that they match. Um, so in this case, oh, I actually didn't want to use export there. So let me pull up my, um, oh, one. So there's nothing in here but a make file. So I've got make file and a subdirectory that has its own make file. So if I go into a subdirectory and do a make, welcome, I get welcome mud because I've declared the variable name mud. Is this, can you see it back there? Do I need to bump up the font? Is it okay? It's hard to see. Okay. Maybe I can compensate for the lighting with the size. No, not, not that far. Yeah, I could probably fix that too. Um, is it is it okay? Is it clear? Not, I mean, is it illegible or? Okay. So here we set the uh, the make variable mud, and we say welcome, and then this is a make variable, not a shell variable. Let's go out to here. If we look at this make file, this is the outer make file. Um, this is a target specific or rule specific variable. This is a make variable, not a shell. Name equals Jerry. And, and then so these two are merged. And we say, hello, Jerry. And then we invoke make again. This is, you can make, invoke make recursively. This is like tars c, which says we're going to change directory into here. And we're going to run make welcome inside of the lower directory. So if I say make welcome here. Oh, make welcome. I've got hello Jerry and then hello mud. If I um, if I export this variable, then that variable gets through down into the sub makes there. Well, don't feel uh, bad if. Uh, you didn't catch all of that. We'll be actually covering examples that will illustrate these a little bit better. Um, you can set pattern specific variables. In make, the percent sign is a wildcard operator. It will match uh, things. So in this case, if I said make install beta, uh, this matches. And so the variable server will be set to that string. And then the recipe runs. Uh, echo installing to joe.beta.internal.com. Again, that's not a shell variable. That's a make variable. Before the shell gets it, um, it has already been changed from $server to joe.beta.internal.com. Um, restart also matches because it's something dash beta. And we have two things dash beta here. So this is a way to set one variable for multiple, multiple targets. Oh, I should also add, I can show you this. Um,
I can say make install beta, restart beta. I can put multiple targets on the command line and they will be run in the order that I give them. Um, some finer points of recipes. Um, the at symbol tells make don't echo the command before you run it. By default, make will print the command out that it's about to run, and then it will run it, and then you'll see the output. Uh, the at sign says don't do that, just, just show us the output of the command. Uh, the hyphen before a command tells make to ignore the error code. Sometimes you might have a situation like this, especially in a cleanup target or a clean target, where you want to clean up some files, but if the file doesn't exist, um, you don't want that to be an error, that's okay, it's idempotent. And so you're just going to um, ignore that if there's an error. You can combine those. You can have an at and a minus together in any order, and um, make will do the right thing with those. A dollar sign in, um, in a recipe or in a target or in a, in a dependency list um, indicates that a variable is coming, and make is about to, wants to translate that from its variables into their values. So if you need a literal dollar sign, you have to escape it with another dollar sign. So dollar dollar becomes just a regular dollar, and that dollar sign will then be passed to the shell. So in this case, um, uh, echo process ID dollar 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 dollar. Those those four dollars become two dollars, and that gets handed to the shell, which the shell realizes is the process ID of the current uh, of the current process. So we're going to walk through a little exercise here on how to think like make, okay? We're going to invoke a rule, um, make install beta, like, like we saw earlier. So make looks at this and says, is this target up to date? Now, wh how do we know if it's up to date? Um, it either exists as a file or a directory, and it does not, we'll pretend. Um, it is older than its dependencies, and there are no dependencies here. So in this, this is a, um, and it's not uh, marked as, as a, this may or may not be marked as phony, uh, but in either case, this, is, this rule is out of date, and so it's going to run the recipe. Um, so therefore, we execute the recipe. To execute the recipe, make removes the special character, the at sign, and then in the next step, it, uh, it does the variable interpolation and swaps out dollar $server for its value, and this line right there is what gets handed off to the shell. So the variables happen before the shell ever sees them. And then we execute the recipe. Um, make has a variety of special variables that I hinted to earlier. I'm not going to get into these specifically, um, but you should know that they're there. They can be very useful. Uh, this is the name of the currently running target. This is the part that matched the percent sign in a pattern and so forth. Um, other obscure variables. You saw this earlier in the recursive make example. Uh, make also have some built-in functions that are very useful. Uh, the shell function does what you might expect. It calls out to the shell. What's, whatever is in the ellipsis here will be handed to the shell, and the output will be captured. This might be, you might have some variable equals dollar shell and those things, and that's how you would go out to the shell and get something and put it into a variable. Um, so, yes? Is there any way to get scattered error? Um, redirect to. Okay. Yeah. Um, Substring, this is for replacement. It's like uh, in uh, a regular expression, s slash slash slash. Uh, strip filter, filter out is like grep v, sort, et cetera. Um, the other interesting one here is call, which is like JavaScript call. It invokes a function um, for you, uh, but the function is in a variable name. Um, OK, as I mentioned before, every command in a recipe executes in its own shell. So I'm going to bring up an illustration of that. So here's our make file. Um, if I run where am I, uh, we have three commands in there. We have a make dir, uh, and we change directory into that new directory, and then we print the working directory. And then we print the working directory again, and then we clean up the working directory. So because we don't have the at sign, we echo the command. So that, that matches that up there. Uh, here's our current working directory is the new directory we made, ZZZ. Uh, we do print working directory again. We can see that 
we're not in ZZZ anymore. It's as if we didn't invoke two, you open up two terminals, right? They're, they're totally different processes. That's true in a make recipe. So if you're thinking they run kind of like a shell script, they don't. That's, that's another difference. They're like independent shell scripts that are running. Um, and then we can clean up the directory here, remove, uh, because we are actually in the directory we were when we started before we made the directory. So that gets cleaned up. I'm going to run this make process here, just to illustrate the point. Uh, echo dollar dollar, 45073, 45074. Different PIDs, different processes. Uh, is there a way to get everything to run into one process like you would expect in a shell script? There is. Um, there's the, the top way and the bottom way. The top way is to use one shell. Um, I have not had very good luck getting one shell to work as I think it should. Um, to be honest, if I need shell commands to run the same shell, uh, I use the bottom version. Uh, I'll use the continuation, new line continuations. Uh, or if it's too big, I put it in a shell script. This is one of those borders of what make is good at, in my opinion. One shell is kind of like a, well, I guess we can make it work, you know, and they, somebody added that in there for somebody for some reason. Uh, but if you're putting tons of shell inside of a make file, um, you probably ought to stick that in a real shell script where you can run it independent of the make file. And now you've got something you could have a test suite for or something like that. Um, but this, uh, what make does is it make other, does a little bit more processing. It takes that backslash new line, removes it, and, and concatenates those strings so that they will run in the same shell. Dana? So, so does one shell apply to just the one target or all targets in the file? The question is, does the one shell apply to uh, just the one target or all targets in the file? It applies to all targets in the file. Mm -hmm. Another reason why you, why you might want to avoid it. Um, like I said, I've, I've never had really good luck getting it to work consistently. And that was not a gospel answer. How about that? Uh, that's how I've, I've seen its effects work like that in the past. It doesn't sit next to the, you, you set this at the top of your make file. And it's just used once. So um, there you go. OK, we're now into the examples. Um, so this is a simple make file. Uh, you see the foo. Target has a, has a dependency on bar, so when we run foo, it first checks to see if bar is up to date. Bar does not have any dependencies. It is, um, if, it's, if it exists, and, and we make sure that it does exist by creating it right here, uh, then, it, then it's up to date. If it doesn't exist, it will create that. Um, if foo is older than bar, then this is also out of date. So let's, let's run this. Make. Foo, and you can see that we, uh, the first thing it does is it checked to see if bar was out of date. It was out of date, so it ran that. Now if I run make foo again, foo is up to date. If I touch bar, if I make bar newer, I can make foo, and now it, it refreshes foo because it was out of date. It was older than, than bar. Uh, any questions to this point? So um, here's an example, a second example. Um, we have the docs rule first. It's an empty rule. There's no recipe in it, but it has a dependency on index.html. You can think of these kinds of empty rules as aliases. So docs would be an alias for index.html. Um, next, we define the index.html target. It has a dependency, and it also has a recipe of what to do when it's out of date. So let's read this as make would. Uh, when we run make docs, so we look for the docs rule. There it is. Um, let's look at its dependencies. There is uh, index.html. OK, we, is, is that out of date? Uh, we look at that to see, oh, it has an index.md. So it, 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 it you know, kind of recurses down, down the tree. And, um, and if index.md is newer than index.html, that's considered out of date. It runs its recipe. And then we um, we'll go back up to the top. So let's do that. I have a little um, script called markdown to HTML. It actually doesn't do anything except touch a file. But um, we'll pretend that there's a markdown to HTML converter here that's really cool. 
make docs. And we can see that we echoed the markdown to HTML command. And then we, this is the output from markdown to MD to HTML. Now if I run that again, nothing to be done. Why is that? Because index.html is newer than index.md. If I touch index.md and make it again, it needs to update it because the, the timestamps are different. So we can make this better. This isn't bad. Um, uh, we could also add the, the um, at sign here. And now we don't get the echoing of the output. Something interesting. OK, we can improve this, though. This is nice. Um, but we see that we've got index.html in three places. Once as a dependency, once as a target name, and once as something in the command. So if we created a variable, now if we decided to rename the output document something else, we just need to change it in HTML doc here. Um, docs uh, has a dependency on that variable. This variable appears as the target, and the variable also appears inside of the command. To make, it, it just does very simple string substitutions. And it doesn't matter where the variable is, make will find it and swap it out. Make docs. So uh, we can improve this a little bit further. Let's pretend that um, we want to rebuild the document whenever any of those other files change. We've got index.md, of course, but maybe we've got a style sheet and maybe a little JavaScript file. Um, so we've declared our variable here. We've also declared a new variable there. Here's our standard docs target. Um, now instead of index.md, we're going to use inputs. So when any of these three files change, this will be considered out of date, and it will run, run that. Make docs. Oh, let me. So I've got a doc.js and an index.md and a style.css. Make docs. We did that. Make docs. Um, we're clean. Nothing's done. If I touch the style sheet, now we have to make it again because it's a dependency. We can take this one step further. This is the last of, of this series. Um, oh, we'll add a nice clean target. It's, it's, um, it's polite, uh, especially when working in um, source repositories where other people will be checking things in and out, to add a, a, a way to clean things up if you have side effects in your, in your build. Uh, if you're in a C project, make was really designed for C projects, as you can tell, or where you have a .c file or .h file. Um, that are the dependencies for the .o file, which are dependencies for the binary um, with the linker and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we add a clean target here uh, for tidying up. And um, uh, so before you run git commit, uh, you don't have all this garbage like tilde files. You could put clean to clean up all the tilde files, things like that. So if I say make docs, and make docs clean, make clean, it removed the index.html file. So that's nice. Now, notice if I run make clean right now, I get an error. Um, the error was ignored because I have a minus sign here. Uh, and that's what that ignored is there. So that's, that's what the minus sign does. It gives you that way to keep going even if something went wrong, or from make's perspective, something went wrong. Um, here's another example. We start with um, .phony here because test does not actually exist. We don't want it to exist. So let's go to this. 09. Oops. Yeah, so I can say make, let me cat t the t file here. We've got test.t. Uh, that's a fantastic test file there. Uh, make test. Look at that. We did a good job. Um, and so that's fine. Uh, but the, the thing about test files, if, if I, I keep running this, 
Uh, I haven't actually changed any of the th anything, but the tests keep running. We can we can improve that um, so that the tests maybe maybe we're testing some PM files, right? Some Pro modules. If the Pro modules haven't changed, uh, you know, is there anything to test? So let's we can we can make that here. We'll have the PM files. We list all of our PM files here. Um, this is a little trick that you see in some make files. Um, our test target now has a dependency on a file called .lasttest. And this now has a dependency on all the PM files. If the PM files are newer than .lasttest, then we will run our test, and then we will touch last test. Jeff? If you don't have something inside of your recipe, Yes. Yeah, fix it so it's not a, it will always be out of date and will always run. Correct. Yeah, the question was if if uh, if you don't have some way if something to to update something else, right? Two files to compare, then it will always be considered out of date. That's true. I didn't. And that's why when we ran make test it kept going and going. Oh, well, index.html was our output file. It exists. It was a real target. This is a phony target. Test is, is never meant to exist. So we have to create something for it. But index.html was an actual target in there. But it was comparing it to the, to the string of the other three files. Well, I guess if you updated the one in the front, then yeah, I guess it would Yeah. When I ran my markdown converter, it, it recreated the index.html. Refreshed it. Refreshed it. Yep, correct. Yeah. Okay, so now what we've done is we've, we've run the test files. Uh, we can see that there's nothing, we don't need to test anything because no changes have been made. If I um, touch one of the um, files in here, touch foo, that target is now out of date again. And um, so this can speed up a ton of automated testing, for example. If it's already been tested, uh, you don't have to test it again. So that's not bad. What if we change our test file? All right, we add more tests. Um, we, we might want to add that to our dependency list, wouldn't we? Uh, so that we know to run the tests again. Um, I think naively what we would do is we would simply add t slash test dot t at the end of the PM files and call it good. Um, good style would do something a little bit more like this. Um, this also, and, and this is the last of this set of slides, um, we're now invoking uh, some, some make functions shell. And this just goes out to the shell and runs that command. We've got, we're going to find in the lib directory anything called .pm. And those things are going to get sucked into pm files. We're going to find any t files in the t directory and save it into that variable. We're going to make both of these dependencies <coughs> for that. Um, and now we've got a clean as well that also cleans up our last test. So this is. Um, this is a fairly common Oh, and I've got a make touch here for convenience to create my hierarchy. So if I say make test, make test, touch t test, make test, good. Um, and I can it works just like it, what, what we would expect here. Any questions on this one? James? The make file? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, the way they do that would be to either run clean right. or touch. Um, uh, I mean, you could, you, you know, the, uh, is there a command line? Um, you make the target, but, uh, I think there is a, there might be a command line option to treat all targets as phony. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. Question was, uh, is there a way to always to rerun it, right? Even if you know it's out of date. I mean, like I said, you could remove that last test, but you could run clean and then test again. Yeah. I just want to say, run test, I mean it. You know. I, I, I would do this, make clean test. Yeah. And I can run that, I can do that all day long. Right? Um, yeah. Any 
you're designing the make file, so what, you know, what your use case is might be different than my example use case. Right. But, but this is just to illustrate the, the, the dependencies, orders, and, and things like that. It's a good question. <laughs> OK, and there's only one slide on this one. This is on recursion. I hinted at this earlier. This is an example of a recursive make. Uh, we define the repositories we want to use, and then we run make inside of each of those repositories. Um, this is based on a little bit of work that James Lance and I did last spring. Remember this, James? So um, I actually uh, have a little something here. Um, so if I look at, let's go into core lib, and it has a, it has a make file. It has a clean and a test target that are phony. Uh, we set a, the, um, the source where it will be checked out as capital SRC. Uh, repo is set to our core lib path in stash. Uh, we have this target. Uh, if, so if source directory slash core lib does not exist, it's going to clone it and create it for us. Um, then we'll run some tests. So I can run this right now. Make build. See how good the Wi-Fi is today. Not bad. Now I can make test. As you can see, I'm not really running tests, but um, but the uh, we have checked out things into source. So I'm going to make clean. I don't have a real clean on this one. So and and the um, cat. Uh, these uh, make files are virtually identical. This is the secure dev one, and that's the core lib one there. You can see the differences are in where the source gets checked out, the repo name, um, and then some strings here. But the targets themselves and the dependencies are all identical. There's very few changes. In fact, these little changes here could be set as variables as well. And then at that point, you can actually merge the make files and just use, you know, share them up at some other point. We're not going to do that here. We're going to look at this make file. This is the outer make file that's going to be doing the recursion for us. This gets a little fancy. And this is, I think, I, pr I promise this is the fanciest we'll get today, I believe. Um, we are going to define our repositories as core lib and secure dev. Those are going to refer to those two directories that are below us. The only thing is in there that are the make files. Remember, there's no source checked out yet. Um, for build, we're going to use um, makes for each um, function. Uh, this is the variable a repo that gets used over here. So this is like my you know, dollar variable in Perl or something like that, or in C. Uh, Repos, we're going to be referring to this repos here. And then we're going to invoke the, uh, we're going to create this string here, build dash core lib, build dash secure dev. And those become the uh, dependencies for the build target. And then once that build target, uh, so where do those live? Well, they live right here in this wildcard. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run recursive make. We're going to change directory. Here's one of the special variables here that matches what was in the percent sign, which would be uh, core lib or secure dev. And we're going to run their build uh, target. And those are, those are in the subdirectories. So if I say make build, you know, check out everything there. And now we checked out secure dev. And now I can say make test, runs the core lib and secure dev tests. Um, I don't have any, you know, is it too old tests like that, but uh, make clean and everything's cleaned up. And what I did, oh, I shouldn't have, I can make build core lib. Um, the make file sets, We're exporting the source directory down into the sub makes so that things will not be checked out into the subdirectory source files, source directories, but in, in, the, in source now. And here's where we have core lib. Am I going too fast? Did you follow that? 
So we didn't check things out. In, normally, if we just CD'd into the core lib directory and did a build there, everything happens inside that directory. We're one level out, and we define where that source directory is now. And we've just, just chosen to, build, to do it outside of those subdirectories. So you can, with variables, you can, you can move things around very conveniently. Oh, bonus example. Here's how to use call. We're going to define a macro or a variable, whatever you want to call it, here. Uh, it's called find. It uses the find shell script. Uh, we're going to pass in $1, which is an argument, and $2. Um, we're going to invoke that right here with call, uh, find. And here's the first argument that goes right there. And that argument goes right there. And those, uh, so the result of that ha uh, goes into find.pm. Now this is a, is this a lazy or an immediate? Lazy. It's lazy, so that means um, this doesn't happen. This is deferred until it's actually used here. So it will not be looked up until we run make test. So we hit make test, it finds this, it goes ah, and it runs, and it runs that shell script all the way out, and, um, and does the same for the T directory, uh, any dependencies there. And it will run them. So that's that's kind of a. This is again at, at the other edge of a boundary of what make is, you know, good and capable of. That's barely legible. If you're familiar with make and you live in make files all day long, this is something you would do a lot. Um, if you're just casually, what the heck is going on with this make file? Uh, you wouldn't want to perpetuate this, but it's good to know that this is this is a, an option there. Um, Make test doesn't do a lot, but you can see it's 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 finding all the right things as it's supposed to, and and going down there. Um, there is a section in the Make manual at the bottom called Make Conventions, and if you are planning on creating or working on an open source project that uses Make, um, I highly recommend reading that section. Um, a lot of those conventions are you get for free when you use tools like Auto Make and Auto Configure. If your project, uh, if you ever type dot slash configure when you've downloaded an open source project, that's auto config, and it's building your makefile for you. And the, the makefile comes, um, it, there's, there's, they use their own language to build a makefile for you. But, but make is still part of that tool chain. Uh, then you use funky stuff like this. This is the, um, the first of the um, dependencies, and then this is the name of the target here. So you, you, you eliminate all kinds of redundancy using those, and it makes the recipes uh, portable and so <laughs> forth. But it does definitely make them harder to read if you're not familiar with those. Uh, and that is it. Um, I highly recommend the manual, uh, the GNU manual. It's very well written. Um, I usually don't go to Wikipedia except to look at the link section at the bottom, but um, there are some really good examples in there that I, I came across earlier this week. That if you're, you know, if, if make is something that you have to uh, get familiar with, um, don't don't dismiss the Wikipedia out of hand. It's it's pretty good in this case. Um, I think that's it. Any questions? Yes, Jean. So in the past, I've used make, and sometimes they have where you can run make and then make install. How does, if you just run just make, how does that work? Oh, that's a good question. The question is, what happens when you just type make? Um, there is usually at the t it will run the first um, recipe it finds, and usually at the top there'll, there'll be like an all colon, and and then like build. It'll be an alias for something. Make all is is generally the the entry point, and that's also in the conventions, at, in the make manual by the way, is how to how to structure that. I didn't cover that here because it's a stylistic issue, not really dependent on how make runs, but. Um, uh, make will run. I could go and um, and just say make here. Um, touch make, and it, it just runs the first rule that it hits. Uh, but you don't want to leave that to chance. If, like I said, if you're a real make author and you're working in a new make file or something, you want to explicitly put an all at the top, uh, either after the variables or before. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then have that all point to your, the one that you would expect the default to be for, for your project. And usually that's a build or, or something like that, make compile, whatever you call it. Good question. Any other questions? 
Uh, Trang? Uh, how widely has make been used? How widely has make been used? In yeah. Our oh, in our environment, not very much, actually. Um, Bluehost does not use the make toolchain uh, in general. What's that? Yeah, there are some there are some projects that use it. Um, if you are um, if you need to install your own Perl modules, um, Perl does uh, typically if you download a module from CPAN, you'll type Perl makefile.pl. That that uh, creates a makefile for you, and then you run make, and then you run make test make install. Um, most most languages and frameworks um, use make in some form. Um, uh, we don't use it in our tool chain very often. We use it in the SMI project that Jean and I are on, um, a few other little ones, Skynet. But um, our day-to-day our -day operations, we've, we've put most things in Perl scripts and things like that, a little bit non-standard. I have a soapbox that I'll stand on sometime about that, but right now is not the time. Any other? So we can use it when, whenever we need to, or once. That would be up to your team, I would suppose. It would probably be team-specific. I'm not, gonna, I'm not advocating Make, but you will come across Make um, everywhere else in the world. You download any open source project, go onto GitHub or wherever, it's everywhere. Um, not all languages um, use it as their core builder. Some of them will use something like it, um, but many of the, even those ones will also create some Make files somewhere along the chain and, and, and invoke those. It just has, it's been around for like 30 years. It's a really old piece of software. But there were commits on it this year, or late in 2016. It's, it's an active project still. There's, uh, I think, four developers on it. I don't think they're full time. But um, it's, it's still, uh, still, still very much alive and something you'll see if you stay in the Unix world. Here, here at Bluehost. What? What, what guidance? I can't give you any guidance, but if you're, if you're on a team and you've got a new project, um, you could recommend it to the team, and if the team agrees, that's something that they want to support. Um, I think you know, that would be up to your team to decide. Mm -hmm. We do have it on some other smaller projects, like I said, so it's not like you cannot use it. But Jason? Another good example of that is whenever you're taking some code that we're open sourcing, we have quite a few uh, Perl modules that we've released to CPAN, and therefore all of those we have going to yeah. our case. For the recording, Jace said that um, a lot of our modules, some of our modules get open sourced and those should have a, a good make file in them or a way to build a make file. Anything else? Thanks for your time. <laughs>